Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk. Uh, <laughs> today we'll be talking about privileged containers and what those are. And yep. Thank you to IT for finally getting a monitor big enough. <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm Frenchy. Uh, Sam Stewart is my real name, but a lot of people know me as Frenchy on the internet. Um, I'm the Infrastructure Security Engineering Manager at Cruise. Uh, Cruise is a company that makes self-driving cars. Infrastrec uh, does many things. One of them is container security. Cool, and I'm Maya. I'm a product manager at GitHub working on software supply chain security. You may know me more recently. I was working on container security at Google, and uh, we're talking about um, how, to, how to help protect privileged containers in your environment. So on today's agenda, we'll be covering um, privileged containers. So why this talk? Well, using the privileged flag is exceedingly common, and it's also kind of dangerous. So we want to make sure that you're following best security practices here, good security hygiene. Um, the idea here is that you can you know, take what you need to know and go back to your companies or your clients to tell them to stop using the privilege flag. So we'll cover what a container is and what things like container D and seccomp and all these acronyms and terms you've heard before are. Um, what the privilege flag actually does in terms of all the features that you can control uh, individually and capabilities that you can control using um, that flag and like what they do, what happens if you don't block those. And then we'll talk about isolation in Kubernetes and some options you have for further restricting what containers can do. Wonderful. Cool. Um, so very scientific audience participation analysis. Uh, I only speak pirate, uh, so please give me a big loud yar uh, when I call out your uh, particular distinction. Uh, who here has never heard of the term containers before today? Yar! One person, I don't believe you, Ian. Um, anyone else? Nope, wonderful, cool, good, so at least somewhat familiar. Uh, who has heard of them maybe once or twice, but not super familiar? Um, maybe you've you know, used it once or twice. Big yar, please. Excellent, wonderful. Uh, who's familiar using it in prod, or even you know maybe like work at Docker or, or some other container companies? Big yar? Yar. yar. Okay, cool, about even split there. Uh, and who here is just to post memes on Twitter? Yar. Most of the audience, exactly Sounds what I suspected. Right. Thank you. Brilliant. So diving into what a container is, containers are just a logical extension of kind of where the industry has been headed in general for many years in terms of making applications easier to package and to deploy. So first you were running like a rack, like somewhere on-prem. This meant managing your own data center with your own servers, the, the OSs that you have for those servers, patching, all that stuff. You basically have like two, at least two full things to manage. You're managing a data center, like actual hardware, and then you're also managing the apps that run on top of those. This is particularly annoying for your ops team. Hello, good morning. My name is Gustavo. I'm here to introduce our next uh, guest speaker, <laughs> Colin O'Brien, and he's going to be speaking. I am the current um, speaker. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is particularly annoying for your ops team. So if a piece of hardware went down, something like that, your application was down, and you had to then um, have maintenance windows. Like between you know, 2 and 6 AM on Sunday, everything went down, and that was totally normal, and somebody was in the data center, and they hated their jobs. Um, then a few decades back, uh, virtual machines came along the scene. They became increasingly popular as a way to manage your applications. So with a VM, you can move your workload virtually between several different servers, including between servers on-prem, but also from on-prem to the cloud. And that just made your app slightly easier to manage. And now we have containers. So a container is just a way of packaging together your application with its libraries and dependencies. This lets you abstract away the underlying hardware as well as the underlying OS. So that you don't even have to worry about what OS you're running on on those machines, and they can be different. The goal with containers is to be able to write and build once and run anywhere, where anywhere is your uh, on-prem data center, or private cloud, public cloud, anything, your IoT device, wherever you want to and so let's quickly distinguish between a couple of different projects if you're not as familiar with the container space. So on the left-hand side here are container runtimes. A container runtime is a standard for what you use to run your containers. Uh, many of these are now based on the container runtime interface, or CRI. Uh, some common container runtimes you might have heard of include Docker, container D, run C, et cetera. And a container runtime is where you can actually implement a lot of the controls that we'll be talking about today when it comes to restricting what a container can do. Um, so because those are con implemented at runtime, which makes sense. Now, if you only have a handful of containers, then you need a runtime like container D, but you don't really need a whole lot else. Like you're okay managing those you know, semi-manually. If you're running a lot of containers and running applications at scale on them, running anything in prod, then you're gonna want something also called a container orchestration system on the right-hand side here, like Kubernetes, OpenShift, Docker Swarm, something like that. This lets you ensure that you have the right number of workloads running and that you're load balancing between these properly, it can give you monitoring for your workloads, you have a better idea of what's actually going on in your environment. 
Um, and then container orchestration systems use container runtimes to actually run those containers, for example, in a pod in Kubernetes. Um, sometimes container orchestration systems also give you controls to allow you to define additional controls you'd like to implement, but those are still implemented at runtime for what we're talking about today. Uh, we'll primarily be talking about how the privilege flag is implemented in container D and controls in Kubernetes. So one important thing yeah. to add into that as well, you can kind of think it like goes down further the stack, right? Run C then talks to lib container, which is in the kernel itself, and then the kernel kind of does the container stuff below. But privilege by itself, the flag does not exist in the OCI spec. It is not a necessary part to run containers. It is a convenience flag that is originally from Docker that has been inher inherited down into container D for historical reasons. Um, but to run a container in compliance with the spec, you don't need to have the privilege flag. Now back to the good security stuff. So containers are really just based on C groups and namespaces. These are two Linux constructs that are used to isolate resources on the same host. Uh, C groups are resource limits that prevent any single process on your host from consuming too many resources, like memory and CPU. This is about preventing unnecessary or unlimited use of a valuable resource on a particular host, so you can restrict one project from using another project's resources. Namespaces are a way to segment processes so that they're isolated from each other. For example, for network resources or mounted file systems. This isn't like security isolation isolation. It's more, I don't think of this as a strong security boundary. It's more about restricting one project from accessing another project's information. And so when we talk about containers and, app and protecting applications in container, we also need to talk about capabilities. Uh, Linux capabilities are individual privileges that a process can use. So these include anything and everything you might want your application to do, such as writing or writing, reading or writing audit logs, bypassing permission, permission checks, or um, specifying configs for mandatory access controls or Mac. An unprivileged container runs as, well, what's now considered kind of normal. First, you're going to verify that it has the appropriate restrictions, then those are met before allowing the process to run, um, and then you can ensure that it only runs with the given capabilities. However, a privileged process bypasses all permission checks. So it runs with a user ID or UID of zero, which is effectively a root or a super user. And those privileged containers can perform actions with any capability. And so if you think about this, like why does that really make sense? Well, this came out historically that cap capabilities came after the concept of a super user. So before you ran everything as a super user as root, and it was like, well, that doesn't really make sense. I want to restrict some of the capabilities this has. This doesn't actually need that many capabilities. So we started chunking up individual powerful actions um, and allow you to implement the, the principle of least privilege in your environment. Uh, note that you can also still restrict some root user permissions, though. And so now that you have a rough understanding of capabilities, how do you actually grant and limit these? There are a couple Linux security constructs here. The first is AppArmor, which is a Linux security module, or LSM, that lets you restrict your program's actions, things like file reads, writes, and executions. It basically means that somebody can't run arbitrary commands in your environments that you might not want to run. And SE Linux, or Security Enhanced Linux, is also a Linux security module that lets you restrict your program's actions, specifically around mandatory access controls. Um, it's very similar to AppArmor, uh, but instead of uh, identifying file, files by their path, which is what AppArmor does, SE Linux uses inode numbers. Um, you don't need to use both. In fact, you can't use both because they, they have the same kernel interfaces. You can only use one of the two LSMs. But just pick which, whichever one is, is best for your environment, given like your understanding of inodes and file paths and et cetera. And then the third item listed here, seccomp, or secure computing mode, basically filters the set of syscalls that your application can run. It puts your application in a sort of like one-way secure state, so that if your application tries to do a particular syscall that it's not allowed, like say return or exit, then that process is automatically killed in your environment and can't execute. Um, there's a pretty good default out there, the Docker seccomp default profile, that limits about 50 uncommon or potentially unsafe syscalls in your environment. And take a look at that if you're not familiar what to do here, and use that to get started and iterate on that. Wonderful. Uh, so again, audience participation. Um, who recognizes these? Yell them out. What? Konami, code. Konami code, all right, that's the easy one. What about the other ones? Doom, Doom yes, excellent. What about the third one? Duke Nukem, uh, okay. No one else plays that, I'm still finding, yeah, trying to find someone else who played Duke Nukem as a kid. Um, but yes, those are the cheat codes. Each of those effectively, I mean, Konami Cone did lots of things, but they all turn on God mode, right? So you can think of privilege as effectively God mode for containers. Um, alternatively, uh, who knows Dan Walsh? 
Um, he did a lot of talking around uh, SE Linux, uh, was one of the tech lead on the project, now also does a lot of uh, talks on, on container security, uh, but he's uh, partially known for, you know, stop disabling SELinux.com, which is a wonderful website that talks about using set in force zero versus set in force one, right? Uh, and privilege is effectively the set in force zero of the container world, right? Uh, security teams may go to great lengths to invest in security controls, but as soon as you use dash dash privilege, you've just thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So, you know, taking those analogies, you know, back to what we were talking about before, privilege, using that privilege flag basically um, undoes all the good security work that you've just done using all the features that we just talked about, like AppArner, NSC Linux, and SecComp, et cetera. So it lets your processes run free with all of the capabilities. So privilege containers don't run with restrictions like AppArmor. And as if it were a root user, privilege containers give you access to everything, for example, all the file mounts in your system, which is very dangerous. And what's really, really scary about that is that allowing those privileged containers is just a single flag. So it's so easy to forget this when you're copy pasting a command or when you're typing it into your prod environment instead of your test environment. And that is extremely scary. So to scare you a little bit more, let's go to some demos. Even more scary is if the demo gods decide to, that I've made sufficient sacrifices and they want to work. Uh, so let's try that and then, I know. Someone in the front row just said, what's he doing? He's changing HDMI cables in the middle of a presentation. <laughs> oh no. Um, did that just flash up for us? We got one, we got a, I can see it. Magic. Hey, there we are, wonderful. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you for coming. Um, no, uh, so we'll do a bit of a, uh, a code walk here. So this is the source code from Container D recently, uh, and this is how the with privilege flag is particularly implemented. Um, so uh, with each of these, we'll, we'll basically prettify it uh, and then talk through each of those. Um, so with all capabilities, adds all Linux capabilities, as Maya was talking about before. Um, so this is commonly used when uh, you try or someone tries to do a thing and then it, it doesn't work, right? I, like, oh, I, I tried to, you know, expose a port below 1024. Container failed. Oh, I, I, I tried to, you know, send some raw packets. Container failed, right? Um, the intent of this section here is as the audience here, you already probably care about security. Um, here are some alternatives that you can propose instead when you go back to your business, right? Um, so CapNet bind service is a capability that you can add instead of CapSys admin, the super privileged God mode privilege. Um, CapNet raw yeah, does a bunch of things, but hey, if that's not working for you, try CapNet admin. That's still less than CapSys admin, which allows for full container breakouts. Um, there's a few other there as well, cap churn, cap sys, cap nice. Um, typically, if your container needs to do something a little bit weird on the host, don't jump straight to cap, uh, uh, to, to cap sys admin with dash dash privilege. Try one of these instead. Yeah, take a screenshot of this super stretched out yeah. thing to wow. tell you to tell your developers what to do instead. <laughs> That is intimidatingly large. Um, cool, so now for the demo time. Um, so let's try, sweet. Um, so can you all see that, is that big enough? <laughs> no, it actually isn't, sorry. Um, there we go. <laughs> this is so satisfying. I highly, everyone submits their feed next year, this is great. Um, cool, uh, so here we have, that's a bit ridiculous. Um, so we're running a normal container, um, and uh, here we're gonna do some con crazy container breakout magic. Um, uh, and then, so we're trying to mount, oh, can't find mount, can't see that file, so we try and mount it. Permission denied to you, root. Well, I am root, right? So I was denied the capability uh, of, of mounting files. And this is just one that we're really highlighting here. Um, so let's try that again, uh, and then we'll do that with privilege and see what happens. Um, so now we can actually see the, you know, the file. So that's a, a, a device on the host. What's that? Oh, you can't see, oh, sorry. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Is that better? Probably not. Um, that was fine. Yeah, but then you can see my personal uh, financial documents below. I don't know if anyone else caught that, so maybe that's not so good. Uh, let me open a new window and do that, and then, hey, all right, cool. This is good. Um, so yeah, trying to mount a particular device. All right, here, now I can actually see uh, that particular uh, thing, and that, what I've mounted there, is the host file system. Um, and so if I you know, list out root, you can see the super sensitive passwords and the dad jokes that exist on the host file system that I don't want anyone to access. So there's your massive container breakout. Um, but it's not really fair to call it a container breakout because everything preventing you from breaking out of a container has been disabled. Um, this is just to highlight how easy it is, right? We mounted a file system. Now you're one of the things that uh, still exists with, uh, with containers, even in privilege mode, is root file system isolation, trivial to bypass and isolate. You can do the same thing with namespaces associated with processes and all the other stuff. 
stuff as well, but this is the, the lead hacks that we wanted to demonstrate of just how easy it was. Mount the file system. Cool. Um, so next up, we have with mask paths. Uh, so there are certain paths uh, in Linux that are particularly sensitive, um, mainly under the proc file system. Um, so uh, I, basically under Linux, everything is a file, um, uh, and uh, that's part of the, uh, the philosophy that goes behind it. Um, but they tend to put some sensitive information about system processes, uh, including hardware configuration information under a virtual file system called proc. Um, so just to pick on one of these, for example, proc kcore um, allows for dumping of memory on the host. Um, and so that dump could then be passed into GDB or volatility or other memory uh, uh, analysis frameworks uh, that you can then use to possibly extract some values out of memory. Um, so we won't do the GDB side of stuff, but we'll just demonstrate um, how we can do this next one. Um, cool, so normal container, try and hit proc, and we can see here the, uh, the, the size of it is, is one, right? Nothing special, not particularly huge. Same thing again with a privileged container. Now how big is it? 128 terabytes. So from within a container, you can actually access the memory of the host. Um, so then, yeah, you could dump that out and, and start doing shenanigans. Um, cool. So not great. Um, Read-only paths. Um, so there are some particularly sensitive uh, paths under the proc, files, uh, uh, proc uh, uh, path that are uh, similar to mask paths, but some of these allow for greater system configuration uh, if they're written to. Uh, so hence, by default, they're read-only. Um, if you add privilege, however, this disables this. Um, so probably the most interesting here is proc sys. Uh, the proc sys directory is slightly different from others under proc, uh, where it not only provides information about the system, but allows the administrator to immediately enable and disable kernel features. Uh, so in this demo, we'll specifically demo uh, Proxys kernel randomized VA space, uh, which is the configuration field for ASLR, everyone's favorite. Um, address space layout randomization is an important memory protection feature, which uh, makes uh, straight memory corruption bug 90s style smashing the stack uh, impossible because it ram randomizes the memory layout. Um, still possible to, uh, to, to have memory corruption issues, um, but significantly harder. Um, and uh, effectively, the threat model in this case is you're running an application that has a known vulnerability in a container, um, but it's a, yeah, it, it has a buffer overflow. This makes it harder to, uh, to uh, get a shell out of uh, that particular vuln. Um, so uh, let's demo that. Um, cool. So here, running normal container, cutting zero in there, and it says read-only file system, denied. Okay. Try that again, uh, and we can see here actually, uh, here cat proxys kernel randomize says two, which is enabled. Um, so let's try that in privilege mode. So here, catting success, no issues. Um, we zero, but then also let's exit out, and then we'll hit it on the host as well. And so here we can see cat proxys kernel randomize VA space on the host is now disabled for the entire system. So all ASLR is disabled because of one privilege container. Cool. Next up. Uh, writable sysff. What happens if you thought of that? What happens if you knew, hey, I know that there are some sensitive mounts, I'm gonna write, only mount them as read-write. Well, conveniently, privileged uh, flag has thought of that and will iterate through every single uh, mount and then take all the read-only ones and make them read-write. Great, thanks. Um, all right. Next up, we've got uh, controlling C groups. So we mentioned C groups. Um, with C groups, the particular thing here is, is it's around resource utilization, um, and so the risk here is effectively DOS, uh, as we mentioned. Um, but um, let's let's make a C group um, and see how that works. Um, cool. So uh, nope, we've already done that one. AP4. Cool. Uh, so here we've got a little test script. Um, so this is uh, just says hello besides SF, um, and so we'll run that. It says hello besides. Hello besides. Uh, Thank you. Um, and then here we'll, uh, we'll make a particular C group. So if you make a directory, that's from the kernel's perspective, there are binaries that you can use to interface with this, but with the kernel, if you just make a directory under sys, fs, C group, memory, and then the name that you want to call it. So we'll call this one big. Um, hello besides SF, still running. Uh, and then if we go and just ls what was in that directory there, we can see out, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's created this. We didn't make any of these files, but there's some interesting things here that we can play around with, C group procs and usage and bytes and so on. Um, um, and so uh, we'll you know, see what the memory limit currently is. And that memory limit is over 9,000 terabytes. Over 9,000? Yes, over 9,000. Not scripted at all. Um, 
uh, and hello besides. Um, uh, and so uh, at the moment, there's nothing in that C, uh, C group. We just made it. Um, so if we look at the, the C group of the particular process, it's under this user slice, the default. Um, uh, but let's go and chuck it in that C group. Um, so let's echo that process ID into uh, C group memory, uh, uh, C group procs. Um, and then uh, if we cat out, for example, uh, we want to have a look at, say, yeah, um, yeah, it's in there, great. Um, and then also if we have a look at the same again, we can see now it's under this big um, uh, matrix, wonderful, uh, big secret rather. Um, sweet, uh, so memory usage in bytes, we can see it's now using you know, 409,000 bytes for that one particular process. Um, cool, so let's go and make another one. We'll make it small, um, and then we'll echo a limit of 5,000. Now for very astute observers in the audience, you'll notice that 5,000 is indeed less than 409,000. Very important. Um, cool, uh, so limit in bytes, uh, we'll set that up. So we've got a small C group. Uh, we'll modify our, oh, that's funky. There we go, we'll basically just edit it uh, for that. Those who missed that, basically we just edit it from hello B-side to B-side sucks, um, which obviously we don't like that. We'll trigger that one again, uh, and then we'll echo that process ID into the small C group, and it doesn't run. And we can and see here, it's killed, right? So the small C group was memory constrained, basically. So that's how C groups work. We just made one manually. Um, uh, and so, yeah, the small one that used way too much memory was killed. Um, excellent. Uh, so uh, some of the other ones here, uh, so SE Linux and App Armor Profile, we'll kind of deal with these both together because they're, they're uh, both mandatory access control systems, effectively. This is a great security system, SE uh, Linux uh, 740 we were talking about before. Um, if enabled on the host, you have the capability to disable it uh, or effectively from within a container. Um, so the demo for that is, oh, let me just run this, and then AP6, I think we're up to, oh, AP5. Is that the last one we got? Cool, uh, so we're in a container here, we'll make a new file, and the thing we wanna highlight here, don't necessarily need to know how SE Linux works, but there's this container valid label that's already applied to the file, um, so it's, it's created in this particular container. If I try and change that label to something like super secret, or super secret, if I could type, um, uh, check, yeah, failed to change the context of new file to a particular thing, right? Can't do it, okay. So let's go and now run a privileged container and do the same thing. Uh, and cool, so we'll basically from our first step, we'll delete hacks to break out of the container. We're gonna mount the host file system again because we wanna access files on the host. Um, so we'll go and do that. Root, and then we can see here the labels. Oh, this dadjokes.txt, super secret label. This effectively, in, in this hypothetical circumstance, say that denies read access to that file, right? I, me as my process, I don't have the ability to look at it. Um, so let's go and change that to unconfined, which lets anyone read anything. Wonderful, great, and then I can see the label on that is successfully changed. So I can modify SE Linux on the label, uh, on the host from my container, and now I can read out the dad joke, which is ultimately what you're all here for, I'm sure. No reactions whatsoever, not even a groan. No, uh, okay. okay, wonderful. And then finally, a uh, set combine can find, uh, no particular demo for this, but this is uh, in, in uh, Docker by default about, yeah, I think roughly 50 C calls a block. There's actually a, a whitelisting approach where they take. Um, and so this, this removes them. See for the full list, uh, go on set comp. Um, so this is uh, yeah, a, a security feature that uh, is also disabled. Uh, Great, so we know why it's scary to have privileged containers in, the, in our environment, so how do we actually prevent that from running? So keep in mind, again, that we're not talking about like strict security isolation, like something you'd use to do malware analysis, but you still need multiple layers of isolation for, for your containers. Um, you're gonna wanna have two sets of controls so that if one layer fails, you're still protected, right? Defense in depth. And so um, one of the things you can use in Kubernetes, Kubernetes has several nested layers of um, isolation. Uh, there's a blog post on that that I'm just gonna skip through. Um, you can also use in Kubernetes security context and pod security policy, or alternatively a pod security policy, open policy agent and gatekeeper. Those are admission controllers that you can use to enforce what gets deployed in your environment. There's a thing called KRL. We're talking on it tomorrow at 11 a.m. Come check it out. And then lastly, um, isolation in Kubernetes using things like Kata containers, GVIs, or Nubla containers to actually prevent what's running in your environment. And I'm skipping this, and summary. Wonderful, um, um, so. cool. So here's our summary slide, a bit of a lightning round after the technical details. But. Yeah, the idea is that privilege flag lets your processes run free. You're gonna to wanna to restrict that. There are lots of different privileges in your environment that um, Frenchie went over. And then you can use various things in, in Kubernetes to actually provide those two layers of isolation. Check out some links. Yep, and then besides, we'll, we'll chuck the slides up later. 
Oh. Just leave the links up. Yeah, so cool. people can take a photo of that. Um, but we've got some questions on Slido. Please hit us up or come say hi. NF Frenchie or Maya Katarowski. We'll be here somewhere down yeah. here. Sweet. Thank you.